short, and this is only 10 minutes, the points that were made in the opening statement, okay? And then I'll kind of read the room a little bit, and we'll see if we need a break between that and the cross-examination. We're doing fine on schedule, I think, so we'll see how it goes. Okay, and so Pastor Matt's going to be first in the rebuttal, and uh, then Vic, and then we'll, we'll flip to where Vic goes first in cross-examination, asking questions, and Pastor Matt answers questions. Okay? Are we having fun? Yeah. Yes. I think this is great. Okay? I'll be right over here, Dean. You got to love it. Okay, for my rebuttal. Now I, okay, for my rebuttal, uh, first of all, I'd like to say, the new birth is the work of the Spirit of God alone, and not of the, and, and one of the consequences of this new birth is that our eyes, of the, the eyes of the blind are open. And as a result, the mind has understanding. It sees clearly now, whereas formerly it had been the darkness of spiritual blindness. Now at last, the sinner is convinced that this book, the 66 books, is different from, from all other books. The Holy Spirit is bearing witness to them. Now he beholds that it is from God in a sense that is true of no other writing. The divinity of the scriptures is the first time clearly perceived by the Christian, and the voice of the Heavenly Father is distinctly heard. God's the one that teaches us. Our infallible teacher is the triune God of Israel. We don't esteem the Bible over Jesus Christ, but realize it's God's word, and you cannot separate a person's words from the speaker. Matthew 12, 34. What comes out of the mouth reveals the heart. The Bible is the means that we learn from, about the nature of God, about salvation, about the effects of sin, and we read of God's love for us. The Christian song that says, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so, is a profound statement and illustrates the believer's passion for God's Word. It is the Holy Spirit that bears witness with you, that teaches you. That's your personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You have the responsibility to make sure what's being taught to you lines up with the 66 books. Now, I was talking about the church. Okay, the church. The church is uh, a body of born again believers, it's not a building, it's not an organization, it's a spiritual entity. If, I, if there were seven people in a town, let's say seven people, and we didn't, there were no buildings available, and the seven people came together, born in the Spirit, that's a church. It's a uh, person that confesses Jesus Christ as their Savior and has been born again. That's the church. That's the body of Christ. We talk about apostles. Okay? There are three requirements to hold the office of an apostle. You had to be a first-person witness of Christ. That's Acts 1.22, Acts 10.39-41, 1 Corinthians 9.1. You had to have seen Jesus raised from the dead bodily with your eyes, 1 John 1.1. 1, 1. You had to have been directly appointed by Christ, Mark 3.14, Luke 6.13, Acts 1.2, 10.41, and Galatians 1.1. 1, 1. You had to have the ability to work miracles, signs of the apostles, Matthew 10, 1 through 2, Acts 1, 5 through 8, 2, 43, 4, 33, and 5, 12, and 2 Corinthians 12, 12. Those are the requirements of an apostle. So what happens when the apostles uh, uh, left, died in the first century? They, they set up church leadership. They had offices in the church. Christ chose 12 apostles. Matthew 10, 1 through 4, who in turn appointed elders, bishops, and pastors. Acts 14, 23, 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7, Titus 3, 1 through 7, Titus 1, 5 through 9, 1 Peter 5, 1 through 5, who were joined by deacons. Philippians 1, 1, Acts 6, 1 through 7. These offices constituted the human leadership of the church. And you can see this when you go to Acts chapter 20, 17. 
and then 27 through 30. It's the same word that's being used. Elders, overseers are used interchangeably. And shepherd is a function of the office. But let me, and, and, and when I say it first, Peter 5.1.2, Peter refers to himself as a fellow elder and not as a pope or a chief bishop. He also claims equal status with the rest of the apostles in 2 Corinthians 12.11. Nowhere in scripture does Peter claim he has authority over the other apostles or over the entire church. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 19 through 20 reveals that Peter's authority was shared by the author of the apostles and the loosing and binding was not only given to the apostles in the first century but then transferred to the future leaders, Matthew 18, 15 through 19, 1 Corinthians 5, 1 through 13, 2 Corinthians 13, 10, Titus 2, 15, and 3, 10 through 11. Quote, in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 19 through 20, for example, Paul says that the household of God is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, and Jesus himself, the cornerstone. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 6 through 8. There is one foundation, the apostles and prophets. The spiritual house that is then built on top is made of living stones, believers, not more apostles. In this house, every believer is a priest. I wish I had time to go into the priesthood of all believers. Exodus chapter 17, or chapter 19, 5 and 6 is what Peter was quoting in 1 Peter 2, 5 through 9. You have the tassels. And they said, you're all a, a, a nation of priests. He's talking to the nation of Israel. You go to Acts 15, or, uh, Numbers 15, 39, and he, he commands all the people, not just the spiritual elites, but all Israel to make tassels. And those tassels will be made of blue thread. You go to Exodus 28, 31, and Exodus 36, 31, and what are the priests' uh, uh, uniform made of? Blue thread. And Peter says, we're the uh, uh, priesthood of all believers. But let me go on. In short, pouring the foundation is not the role and responsibility of living stones that make up the spiritual house. 1 Peter 2.5 We must distinguish between the apostles who laid the groundwork and all non-apostolic ministers who came after to add to the structure. Paul appears to assume such a metaphor when he says, like a skilled master bell Builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building on it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. As priests, we have, remember, Christ fulfilled the priesthood. Peter says, now what he said about Israel, he says the church is a, a nation of, of, of a priesthood. As priests, we offer up true worship to God with our praise. Hebrews 13, 5. Many Christians believe the church exists either to meet their spiritual needs or to reach out to the world. Both of these are byproducts of true biblical worship. The true and primary reason to come to church is to fulfill our priestly role of offering worship to the true and living God who is worthy of our praise. Thank you. Well, you just heard two different responses to the question, how and where authentic Christian truth is found. I suggest the authoritative church Jesus established under the guidance of the Holy Spirit preserves and teaches all that is in the Word of God, and that, contain, that is contained in both tradition and the Bible. Matt, in the Protestant position, believes in a concept called sola scriptura, where the Bible is the only source of authority. This is the foundational principle of Protestantism. Catholics agree with Protestants that the Bible is the primary source of God's revelation. As a result, the source of God's revelation is really not the major issue at our dialogue today. The bigger issue is who has the authority to interpret and formally teach what's in God's revelation. When a person accepts the Bible as the only source of authority, there is a secondary belief that must also be followed. 
If scripture is the only infallible authority for Christians, then there cannot be another source of outside of scripture. And so what is the result? Everyone using sola scriptura, the Bible alone, now has the absolute right of private judgment in the interpretation of scripture. This means that each person can decide what the correct interpretation of a given scripture passage is, irrespective of what any other person says, because nothing outside of the Bible has authority. Did you get the magnitude of the fact that each fallible person now has the right of private interpretation of the Bible? This means, with no source outside of the Bible, every person can now read, interpret, and determine what he or she believes the Bible teaches, and no one can tell he or she is wrong. And what has been the result of this practice? The Bible is the only source of authority. Has anyone ever driven around Klamath Falls and observed how many different churches there are in our little town? Sometimes there's several on the same street. Although various denominations have contradictory beliefs, they all have one thing in common. They all follow the Bible alone, and everyone has the right to interpret it. For an example of the even greater diversity in Christianity, I have a book that lists the various church groups just in the United States. And I went through this book, and I counted. There are 219 different Protestant denominations just in the United States alone. And what makes each denomination an individual entity? They all use the same Bible, but they interpret it differently. When there are hundreds and hundreds of denominations all believing something different, that tells us Christianity is not united. If Jesus wanted unity in his church, but there are so many different denominations, as evidenced, there's a legitimate question that must be addressed. Why are there so many different denominations believing in contradictory beliefs? Well, in order to answer that, all one needs to do is follow John Newman's advice and go deep in history. When we do, we find that basically there was only one church for the first 1500 years, and it was the Catholic Church. This is undeniable historic fact. Then, in the early 1500s, Martin Luther initiated the Protestant Reformation that radically changed Christianity. What did Luther do? In his personal interpretation of the Bible, Luther believed and began to teach scripture taught a person is saved by faith alone. The method of using a person's personal interpretation to determine biblical truth was never recognized before Luther. For the previous 1500 years, the Bible, as well as tradition, were sources of God's word, and the church that Jesus established was the official teacher of what was contained in the word of God. Historic fact. So what happened when Luther began to teach his personal interpretation of the Bible in regards to how a person is saved. The authoritative church told him, you're teaching error based on 1,500 years of history. At this point, Luther was in a dilemma. Either he could accept the authority of the Catholic Church and say he was wrong in his interpretation, or to validate his new interpretation, he had to reject the teaching authority of the church. History tells us what he did. Luther, at this point, established the two main pillars of Protestantism. These two beliefs started the Protestant Reformation. The first one is called sola fide, or you're saved by faith alone. And the second one, what we're talking about tonight, sola scriptura, or the Bible is the sole source of authority. This is called the formal principle of the Reformation. Luther rejected the authority of the Catholic Church as being the official teacher of the faith, as well as tradition, 
as being a source of God's Word, leaving the Bible as the only source of authority. History tells us that the Protestant Reformation in the early 1500s was launched on Martin Luther's new creation on a way to attempt to determine God's truth. Let me give you a formal definition of sola scriptura. So I stated correctly. Let me quote well-known Protestant theologians. J.I. Packer. The Reformer's whole understanding of Christianity depends on the principle of sola scriptura. What does sola scriptura mean? That the Bible is the only word of God, the only guide for conscience in the church. It is the only source of true knowledge of God's grace. It is, only qualified, it is the only qualified judge of the church's testimony and teaching. So summarizing, the Bible alone dictates that no person or institution can speak for God. All we have are the words in the Bible, and they speak for themselves. However, if one believes the Bible is the sole source of authority, that leads to a very important issue that must be addressed. Here is God's inspired word. It contains infallible truth. Both Protestants and Catholics agree to this. And here's God's inspired word. So what must we do to understand God's inspired word? The printed word on this page, do not speak for themselves. What must be done to understand what's on this printed page? It needs to be read and interpreted. There's no simple way around this. Every act of reading scripture is simultaneously an act of interpreting scripture. Once again, let me quote another Protestant on the interpretation of scripture. Keith Madison. All appeals to Scripture are appeals to interpretations of Scripture. The only question is, whose interpretation? People with differing, differing interpretations of Scripture cannot set a Bible on a table and ask it to resolve their differences. In order for the Scripture to function as an authority, it must be read and interpreted by someone. What sola scriptura means in practice is, although the Bible is the ultimate source of authority, every fallible person has the right to interpret it and declare what those inspired words mean. Once Luther established this new belief, we know what happened. Others began to practice sola scriptura, and after they personally interpreted the Bible and disagreed with Luther, they established new denominations. Here's just a few. Luther. Then Zwingli, after Luther, he disagreed with Luther. Simmons disagreed with Luther and Zwingli. Henry VIII disagreed with Luther, Zwingli, and Simmons. Calvin disagreed with Luther, Zwingli, Simmons, and King Henry VIII. Knox, Smith, Jones. It's documented that in the first hundred years after the Protestant Reformation, there were hundreds of new denominations created. Today, there are hundreds and hundreds of different denominations resulting from different interpretations of the Bible. Just to show you a few of the disagreements. There are some Protestants who believe in salvation by faith alone and some that don't. There are Protestants who believe that you cannot lose salvation and there are some that don't. There are some Protestants who believe in the rapture and some don't. Although, they disagree on all these essential beliefs. There is a belief they do accept. All their beliefs come from the same Bible. I just want to give you a brief example of how interpretation can be misjudged. I'm going to give you a simple six-word verse, and I want you to tell me what it means. I never said you stole money. I never said you stole money. What do I mean by that? Well, let me help you out. How about if I say, I never said you stole money. I never said 
you stole money. I never said you stole money. I never said you stole money. Without an authoritative source, there is no way you would understand the correct interpretation of that verse. The Bible has 35,549 verses to interpret. If it's hard to interpret that six-word verse, what about the rest of the Bible? In closing, sola scriptura implies that God gave us an inspired book, but he did not give us any way or anyone who could authoritatively tell us what that interpretation is. This is an interesting theory, but how do we know today in 2023 whether Sola Scriptura failed or succeeded in maintaining unity in Christian beliefs? I challenge you to consider the short 500 year history of the Bible being the sole source of authority and observe the number of denominations in existence today that have contradictory beliefs in many issues, even in the essentials of the faith. The next time you drive around Klamath Falls and observe the many, many different denominations who believe in contradictory beliefs, think back to the definition of sola scriptura, where each fallible person can interpret the Bible and no one can tell another he or she is wrong. Let your drive around Klamath Falls answer if sola scriptura has succeeded in maintaining unity among Christians. Okay, so I let Vic go over the time a little bit because I enjoy watching a Roman Catholic quote Jay Packard. <laughs> um, we're going to give them a few minutes here to, to work on their cross examination, and then when we go to questions after that, if you want to ask a question. We can do that. We can make it happen. If you would like to submit a question, we can do that. We can make that happen. Um, we're not here to listen to you preach, so let's make it a question. And so you can make us, you know, a statement that leads into it. But I might get cranky if it goes too much. Unless you quote J.I. Packard, then I might let you go. They have sheets there, and that's after the cross examination. Okay, so we'll give them a few minutes here, about five minutes. Thanks, that's a good five. Okay, that's a matter of five minutes. Uh, this is